Okay, thank you very much for the invitation today. So when James Lint undertook his trial of treatments for scurvy in the 18th century, I doubt very much whether he could have envisaged what the clinical trial landscape would look like in 2013. If you Google the term health, you'll get nearly three and a half billion hits. And if you look at the clinicaltrials.gov registry, you'll find over 140,000 entries. Nearly 30,000 of those are recruiting patients right now. If you look at the bottom figure, tens of billions of dollars per year, you might think that that's the cost of this research. In fact, Ian Chalmers and Paul Glazew estimated that this is in fact the cost of waste in research. Poor waste, waste due to poor design, analysis and reporting. For example, we have shown in our research group that trialists select which outcomes to report from those that they've measured in clinical trials based on the results. And they do that in around a third of all trials. So the evidence on which treatment decisions are being made is biased. And when you realize that the problems that cause this waste and cause this cost are actually correctable, then I would assert that this situation is clearly indefensible. Now, the MRC recognize these problems, and they've made the single largest investment in trials methodology research by creating this network of hubs, whose remit is to improve the design, conduct, analysis, reporting, and interpretation of clinical trials. And one of the first things that we did in that network was to undertake a priority setting exercise. We asked trials methodologists what were the key methodological problems that they wanted the network to tackle. And I'm trying to convince you, I'm going to try and convince you today that health informatics approaches can actually contribute to reducing those problems. And I'm going to take the top three problems identified, each in turn. So in 1970, Louis Lasagna, clinical pharmacologist, observed patient availability sharply decreases when a clinical trial begins and reverts to its original level as soon as the trial is completed. Now, 40 years on, that is still a big problem for clinical trials. Now, delays in opening sites clearly contributes to under-recruitment, but it's also very often the case that the number of eligible patients that you anticipate during the design stage just do not materialize. <coughs> So is that because the number of patients is lower than um, you anticipated, or is that because those patients are being missed by health professionals? When you look at the sorts of feasibility studies that are done during the design stage, there's a range. At one extreme, we ask site leads. How many of these sorts of patients do you expect to see over the course of the trial? and you get informed guesswork. So it's no surprise when you do that that you end up overestimating the number of patients that actually end up in your study. But at the other end of the <coughs> spectrum, some trial teams are starting now in the design phase to do prospective screening studies, trying to get a more realistic number for the patients who actually meet the trial protocol criteria, inclusion and exclusion criteria. But obviously, there's a trade-off between accuracy, time, and cost. And one of the big questions is where in that spectrum, where in that trade-off do health informatics approaches sit? So you can imagine searching the electronic health record sounds like a very appealing thing to do. And based on eligibility criteria related to perhaps medical diagnosis and age, things that are well recorded in the record, one would anticipate that the numbers that you're going to get back are pretty accurate. But some eligibility criteria are far more of a challenge. As an example, we were undertaking a trial of treatments for cystic fibrosis. So what did we do? Well, first of all, we went to the UK Cystic Fibrosis Register. And that gave us an overall total of the number of cystic fibrosis patients in the UK uh, as, of the time, as of that time. 
We also actually undertook a study with patients to try to get an estimate of the likely consent rate for that particular trial. When we ran the trial, when we were completed the oh, when we were looking at the data from the trial, we actually found that that estimate of the consent rate was pretty damn accurate, which surprised us all. But actually what we didn't do very well was to get the proportion right meeting one particular inclusion criteria. And that criteria was that the patient had to be free from a particular infection defined in a particular way over the 12 months prior to trial entry. And we overestimated the proportion of patients meeting that particular inclusion criteria. So what we want to do is go back and try to design that electronic health record search, <coughs> see how feasible it is, and see what we would have got as the prediction and compare it to what we actually observed in the study. And we think that more of these evaluations of what's predicted against what's observed in clinical trials based on feasibility studies from electronic health records will be extremely valuable in seeing where those sorts of feasibility studies are placed in this trade-off between accuracy and cost. But health informatics uh, approaches are also used during a study to try to identify patients. So a search is done based on inclusion criteria for a trial, and alerts are set up during either a GP consultation visit or a hospital visit. But what we know from studies where they've reported this problem is that those alerts, those flags on the screen in front of the doctor are sometimes ignored. What we don't know are all of the reasons why they are ignored. Is it time during the consultation or is it something else? Is the doctor making a decision that they don't want to put this trial in front of the patient for consideration? Now, we've undertaken a study. We've interviewed doctors and we've interviewed parents, looking at issues around recruitment of children into trials. And what we found was that pediatricians are quite reluctant to approach parents and a family about clinical trials. They feel trials are burdensome to families. Now, in stark contrast, parents said they want to be given the choice. They want to be told about potential clinical trials that they may, their children may be eligible for. They may not wish to participate, but they want the choice. And similarly, those of you that have looked at the UK Clinical Trials Gateway, it's an online resource for patients to go and have a look at what clinical trials are ongoing in, their, uh, in, in the condition that they may uh, suffer from. At the moment, the gateway, the gatekeeper for those trials is the GP, is the patient's GP. But in a recent survey undertaken by the NIHR, 70% of patients and the public said that they wish to have the opportunity to contact the trial teams directly. So what we need here is clearly uh, more understanding of the feasibility and acceptability of these sort of approaches to the health professionals and also why they don't want to use them. But we also need rigorous evaluations of these methods of recruitment as compared to more traditional methods. The second highest priority identified by the hubs was that of how to choose the outcomes that you're going to measure on patients in trials. And trials would be much easier to run if the outcomes were collected routinely, collected and recorded, measured and recorded in the electronic health record. Now, I've never quite understood why the outcomes that are measured in trials looking at the relative effectiveness of treatments in routine practice, why the outcomes in those trials are not the same as the outcomes that are used in routine care to determine treatment decisions and whether you should change a treatment, and vice versa. Psychiatrists in the room may recognize this number, 640, as being the number of different rating scales that have been used across trials in patients with schizophrenia. 
640. Clearly, insufficient attention has been paid to what are the important outcomes to measure in clinical trials. If you've ever gone and looked at the literature, either as a clinical trialist or as a patient, I'd be amazed if you haven't been frustrated by the inconsistency of the outcomes measured in similar trials of the same treatments in the same conditions. Now, one solution to this is now being referred to as a core outcome set. This is a minimum set of agreed standardized outcomes that should be measured in all clinical trials in, in all conditions. Imagine if that was the case and you go to the literature and the main key outcomes are being measured in all the trials. You can compare and you can contrast much more easily than you can do now. So there has been much written about problems in electronic health records across the countries and, and, and trying to uh, look at the set, entry for the same variable in different databases and problems with the definitions used in different places. I'd like to assert that there's actually a bigger problem than that. The problem is, is, is with what to measure as well as how to measure it. Core outcome sets start with determining what to measure. The most well-established core outcome set is in rheumatoid arthritis, and that is now measured in over three quarters of clinical trials. So one piece of research that we want to look at is the feasibility and quality of the outcomes in that core outcome set in the electronic health record in Salford. <coughs> and there may be implications for the restructuring of the health record as a result of that work. Patients and clinicians are key players in this. We need patients' opinions. And the use of social media tools is increasing in trying to um, obtain that sort of information. Now, the Comet Initiative is bringing these resources together. There's an online, publicly, uh, online, publicly available searchable database. It currently includes 200 entries and it will soon be complemented by a systematic review of over 25,000 papers. The third topic that I just want to briefly look at is that of retaining patients in trials. Randomizing a patient and not being able to measure the outcome data on that patient may be worse for the analysis than not randomizing that patient at all. Bias can be induced if the reason you don't get that outcome data is related to the outcome itself. For example, the patient is too ill to attend the hospital visit. Now, this problem occurs at a level of more than 15% in over a quarter of trials. And so what we need is really high-quality evidence about what approaches can minimize that problem. And there is some evidence, but it's limited, that SMS prompts can help this. Now, a core outcome set may include an outcome that can be measured via a patient diary, such as sleep or incontinence episodes, for example. Current practice is to send the patient away with a paper diary, paper copy of a diary. And here's an example on the screen, and you fill it in. And the data is periodically reviewed, so either at a clinic visit or a home visit. Imagine if this was electronic, linked directly into the trial data management system. You can send SMS prompts to fill it in. You can do immediate validation checks with the patient as they're entering their data. And you can also send SMS reminders if you find that there are some missing data problems. But what we need is patient views about the acceptability and feasibility of new methods of collecting their data. So in summary, as a clinical trialist, I hope I've encouraged you to think about health informatics approaches and how they can help to improve clinical trials, thereby improving health by providing better evidence on which to base treatment decisions. But I also hope that I've persuaded you that we actually need to evaluate health informatics approaches in as rigorous a way as we would expect to do of healthcare interventions themselves. Thank you.